Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I think we can start and probably some more people will join along the way. So uh, welcome to the sixth meeting of the Digital Europe Economic Seminars. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Reinhold Kessler, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Zurich's Department of Business Administration. Uh, Dr. Kessler has previously worked at CEF Leibniz Center for European Economic Research within the, within the Digital Economy Department, where he continues collaboration as a junior research associate. Uh, his research focuses on the economics of digitization and digital platforms, with a focus on competition policy and the role of user data, and topics which he studies extensively empirically and using web script data. Uh, so uh, we're going to have approximately uh, 35, 40 minutes uh, of a presentation, followed by time for questions. And you are also uh, free to ask questions along the way. And uh, so, uh, well, Dr. Kessler, thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and to all of you for tuning in today. It's my pleasure to present a very preliminary work on Apple's app tracking transparency as I'm trying to share my screen real quick. This should work. Let me change this. And so since it's very much early work in progress, uh, comments are very much needed and appreciated. And as Wojciech said, uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any point in time during the talk. And I will also make uh, sure to have a look in the chat and make some pauses. So the starting point of this project is basically the question to which extent there is a tension between the privacy of individuals and the data economy. On the one hand, we enjoy many products and services on the internet for free, possibly with the nuisance of advertising and willingly or unknowingly sharing user data. And in this respect, I want to mention uh, the answer by Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg uh, in a uh, Congress hearing upon the question how they make money of free products. And they, the answer was, Senator, we run ads. And this dependence um, of advertising, um, this dependence on advertising by large parts of the digital economy becomes apparent if you look into the uh, revenues by those big firms like Facebook and Alph uh, Alphabet, where most of the revenues come from advertisements. Now, on the other hand, um, you have worldwide regulatory efforts in order to protect user privacy a bit more and enforce uh, user privacy also in um, most of the parts of the digital economy, say, for instance, the European General Data Protection Regulation or the Californian uh, counterpart. And besides these regulations, interestingly enough, also um, large platforms uh, start to enforce privacy preserving environments and set rules to set somewhat boundaries to the digital economy as do these privacy regulations. One notable example is Google that plans to phase out third party cookies in Chrome, although that has been postponed recently. But in a, some sense, this tension between privacy regulations, privacy preserving rules being enforced and the digital economy run by ads, on the other hand, kind of leads to the question how products and services on the internet are monetized in this new privacy preserving environment. And this is really the key question that I want to tackle in my talk now by studying the mobile app market, again, revisiting the money and privacy trade-off with these new uh, regulatory efforts towards privacy. And now, since I'm looking into the market for mobile apps, it may be uh, important for you also to get to know the monetization in the market for mobile apps. And as you know, there are there is this duopoly between Apple and Google. And the main sources of revenue, no surprise here, are advertisements and in-app purchases. And, but there are notable differences between the two platforms, and we will also leverage later in the talk. 
So take these numbers by Flurry Analytics uh, from last year. They started out with 1 million mobile applications restricted to those with an active user base and then um, looked into those that have at least one of the two revenue sources in place. And as you can see, for apps on Google, um, ads are more prevalent while on Apple, in-app purchases are um, present more often. And there is also a mix of the two revenue um, methods. And now it's straightforward to think of like in-app purchases being necessary to un unlock an, a feature. Um, but on the other hand, uh, and, and also it's straightforward, everybody knows ads, but it's less straightforward to, to know how money is made off of ads, right? And how valuable are actually ads on the app market? And for this, I'm going to show you a stylized example how money is actually made from those ads and how uh, the, the value of these ads somewhat assessed in this market. By the way, for those wondering, um, of course, there are also paid apps in this app market, but they are somewhat in the low single digits, especially for Google, they are not really prevalent in the, in the market, but I'm going to mention them anyways, because we will see it afterwards too. But now for the advertisements, which is really the main revenue source for most of the app developers, how do they actually get money? How is, is it attributed somewhat to a certain degree the success of advertisements that correlate then with the money you get from advertisements. And for this, let me uh, show you a stylized example of how a successful advertisement campaign on an app looks like, and then go from there. So a successful advertising campaign in an app looks like this. So you see an ad, you click on, uh, on the ad, and this is an advertisement of app A. And then you go on to the app store, to see this app A and because you like it, because you like the, the, the advertisement, you download and install the app A. This can already be a successful advertising campaign. Now you can also open the app A and somewhat do a purchase, for example, if there are in-app purchases or if it's a shopping app, you maybe shop some goods. And this event is somewhat recorded and maybe this is also a way to have a successful advertising campaign, so an event for a successful advertising campaign. Now, in order to attribute the success of this advertising campaign to the original app that had this ad in place, you need somewhat to identify the user in this whole cycle. And for iOS, for example, um, the identifier for advertisers was used uh, in all those last years. And this identifier is somewhat transmitted by the original app that had the ad in place to an intermediary measuring this um, advertising campaign. And after the successful event, be it the installation or the purchase within the app, the identifier is also transmitted to the third party uh, from the advertised app. And in this uh, way, we know which kind of users clicked on an ad and which type of users are susceptible to these kinds of advertisements. And in this way, you can improve on the targeting of advertisements and also in, in future uh, periods, um, these ad placements are worth more to the advertiser because they know it's uh, more accurate and we can really count on uh, the success of this these ads. Now this is the basic setup. With this in mind, let's go to the privacy policy change that I'm going to focus. It's uh, called app tracking transparency. What is this actually about? So with uh, the new iOS 14.5, so a new um, operating system update for Apple uh, users, every user within an app that wants to, um, for each app that wants to track um, the user across other apps and websites, think of the identifier for advertising that I showed you before, you have to explicitly ask for the consent of the user 
to actually allow this kind of tracking. And so the user has the choice to either allow this kind of tracking or disallow um, this kind of tracking. And so it's a very easy yes or no question. It's not like an opt out, um, I don't know, a cookie banner game where you have to guide through, I don't know, 13 pages of uh, uh, rejections. And so um, this is really the change that you can kind of um, decide whether you want to be tracked or not. And the app is also not allowed to make the functionality depend on your decision. So your action has no consequences for you. Um, in some uh, aspects that uh, the app is still functioning afterwards. And now what the app can do is actually write you what you get in return for allowing. So this, for example, is the prompt by Facebook. Facebook says, if you allow, you get a better ads experience. So I don't know whether this is convinces people, but this is what Facebook shows you as the as the prompt and some of these apps also have pre prompts like Facebook where they kind of elaborate on the consequences of this decision. And in some sense, they also speak about the trade off that I mentioned. So on the one hand, um, you get ads that are more personalized and Facebook is somewhat uh, not threatening, but saying that you help keep Facebook free of charge if you allow for this kind of tracking. And they also claim that businesses um, that rely on ads are uh, reaching their customers harder. Um, something that I will show you in the stylized um, example of an advertisement campaign in, in real time. Uh, other apps are actually doing this within the, the, the prompt. So they, they kind of claim um, that allowing this will help keep the app or game for free. And there are many more of these prompts um, on this homepage that you can find. And some of them are really interesting to say the least because some of these apps also say something like, we ask for your advertising identifier to connect you with your friends and um, something along those lines. And what is interesting now for us is, or for me is the, the consequence and the impact it has on the mobile um, app market. And just for you to know, this ATT app tracking transparency came with um, this new iOS update at the end of April. And so just to have the consequence um, for, for these uh, of this, privacy policy change, um, if we go back to our um, example of the successful advertising campaign, if a user now disallows tracking of the original app, um, the, the, the app doesn't retrieve the identifier for advertiser from this user. So it cannot really say something about this user X and Y clicked on this and then you can somewhat match it later with the advertised app when there was an, an event. And if you, especially as the user also, if you disallow tracking on the advertised app, then there is no matching possible afterwards and you cannot really attribute the success of an advertisement campaign to a certain user. So in the bottom line is that the targeting of ads uh, is more difficult. And there is also reduced accuracy to measure the return to ads because you cannot really pinpoint which users are actually um, kind of clicking the ad and going through the whole cycle that I mentioned. All right. So I hope this come, became clear. Now the question is, this is only a problem if many of the user opt out, right? Because then you don't have really good knowledge of, of the users and their behavior. If it's only a small share, then maybe it's not a big deal afterward. So the question is, do they opt in or do they opt out? And now quick spoiler, um, most users choose to opt out. And I mean, maybe we have people with Apple devices in the audience and they can say whether they opt in or opt out. And we can compare it now with the following statistics. 
but in some sense, there is tremendous evidence that most users choose to opt out. And so on the one hand, there were surveys conducted before the introduction of ATT, where consumers, users were asked in surveys whether they would in, opt in or opt out when faced with the prompt. And the majority said they would opt out, so they would not allow tracking. And this share was in the 70s, 80s. And of course, you can now claim, OK, if I ask users hypothetically, do they like more or less privacy and maybe also do not really say something about the drawbacks, then it's clear that people will opt out. But there's also actual behavioral data from after the introduction of the ATT by many mobile analytics companies. And their numbers range from 60 to 80 percent, depending on the company and also um, uh, the categories and the country, but um, in some sense, it's always the majority that opts out. And so this is like one component that this impact may, may be huge if you cannot really track most of your users. All right. Now, given the nature of the impact and now with most users opting out, um, uh, let me give you some anecdotal evidence before moving to, to my paper that this is really a huge impact for, for the advertisement industry, especially also in the mobile app market. So there are forecasted revenues of publicly listed companies that already mention and also already kind of predict a negative impact by this change, most importantly Facebook, but there are also app developers having or reporting a decrease of 15 to 20% in revenues because of this change. We also have uh, mobile analytics companies showing that ads are less often, or there are less often bid requests for ads on iOS compared to Android. And also the ads are getting somewhat cheaper or worth less for opted out iOS users following the change as reported by this exemplary app. And at the end of the day, we have this kind of evidence of reduced advertising spending on Apple and increased spending towards Google. All right, and with that, so huge change. And what I'm now going to try to look into is uh, basically the question, how do products and services um, getting monetized in, in this new privacy preserving environment with the mobile app market and the ATT, the Apple App Tracking Transparency as the setting. And for this, I have data um, from both platforms. So from Apple and Google from February, 2021 until July, 2021. So uh, I still scrape data, but what I have is a monthly panel. And for, for each of these several hundred thousand apps, I have information on the app developers monetization and data collection. And the empirical strategy is somewhat twofold, but in a sense, I compare apps on Apple where the policy change happened before and after, and then also compare it with Google um, to have a difference in difference and also can somewhat single out um, what is very peculiar to the platform and the privacy change or what is a cross-platform trend. And preliminary results are the tracking and the likelihood of tracking and the likelihood of ads decrease with ATT and uh, apps somewhat turn towards these payment options. All right. If there are no questions, at least I cannot see any in the chat. I can quickly review the literature. So basically I'm relying on, on previous studies already showing that like mandating privacy policies, disabling cookies, implementing privacy regulations, this hurts the advertisement business, makes targeted ads less successful, lowers revenues. And of course there are plenty of very uh, many uh, GDPR papers that um, cannot even uh, fit on one page, but in some sense, they all come to, to the conclusion uh, that it has some intended consequences in the designated realm. And this is um, what I'm going to show here, but it also might have unintended consequences, which I'm also to some degree will show here. 
maybe it's also intended consequence. You never know about the platform's motive of such changes. And this is also the somewhat the contribution that I have. It's it's really a, a, a change initiated by a platform. So it's a privacy change initiated by a platform. And um, this is also a contribution to the existing literature on trading of money with privacy because this is a privacy change on one platform, like quasi-experiment and not on the other. So even though Google announced it to someone in the future also implement something similar to the tracking transparency, this happened only on Apple right now. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, maybe two clarification questions. So one is that you presented the, the targeting more, I think, in terms of ad attribution, right? So that this cuts off the attribution part. So there's an additional dimension of targeting that you also get access to data about people when they behave on other third party sites. So is this not affected by that or is this just a different focus here? So this would be one question. And maybe just a second one is maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how the platforms actually benefit or how they make the money. So Apple probably has another rational than Google in where the money comes from. Yeah. Um, tremendous question. Thanks. Uh, so yes, so it was a stylized example of one way how uh, this ATT kind of changes. It, it's, it's the attribution mechanism, but of course, if you do not have this um, identifier for advertising, you cannot also kind of match records with behavior on other um, apps. So let's say, I know, uh, for example, if, if, if you disallow tracking on, on other platforms, for example, Facebook cannot match your behavior with this kind of um, app, even though you may have opted in on Facebook, but you cannot really uh, match it with records from other apps that may uh, also give you some idea of uh, your behavior. So it, it's a two-way street, right? Even though if, if you opt in for, for Facebook um, and have this identifier for advertiser, you also need the identifier for advertiser by other apps to, to match records. And for the other one, I will elaborate on the, at the end for the motives of a platform to to do such changes. Of course, as we see saw also at the very beginning, Apple uh, on Apple payment options are more prevalent, and of course, a share of these payments um, go to to Apple and also to Google on the on the other platform. But to some extent, payment options were always a bit more important on Apple, and if now there is a change that Kind of drives the payment options it favors the platform um, on the other hand there are also and i will elaborate on that at the end there are also news reports that apple also kind of expands its ad business so there may be also uh, this line of re reasoning that um, uh, there is somewhat a self-preferencing case here and there are also complaints um, in germany and france already underway by publishers that say that there, is, there are two standards because personalized ads on Apple are also set differently in the settings and not with a prompt. And so uh, there, are, there are different uh, lines of reasonings that you can make a claim that the platform benefits from this change. But thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and somewhat uh, Lynn and Misra also um, really have the ATT, I think, as, as one of the examples that this identity, identity fragmentation, so not being able to match records across many apps and um, uh, websites may make measurement of um, advertising effects more difficult. And this is really also where I'm going to base my hypotheses on, because on the one hand, I want to look into whether the ATT really had an impact on the use of data for tracking, but also whether it kind of changed, decreased the profitability of ads. And this is somewhat based also on all of the motivation above. And the second hypothesis, if we assume that they somewhat want to uh, remain at the revenue levels uh, as before ATT, now with the change, they may have to switch 
to alternative revenue generation methods. And one, if you remember the monetization graphs, is payments. So you just go for in-app purchases instead of ads, for example. So this is also very stylistic, but you can make the claim that you kind of need to think about how to compensate for the revenue loss. And of course, some may also exit, but I'm not looking into that. And my empirical strategy that I already alluded to is twofold. So on the one hand, I can just make a before and after comparison on Apple with ATT as a policy change. And to some degree, for some measures, this is the best I can do because as we will see later, the comparison or the comparability between the two platforms is not always that nice for some measures as an economist would, look, uh, would like. And, but for other measures, I can do the full diff and diff, meaning I can compare apps before and after on Apple with the Google Play Store. So apps on um, Apple with uh, Google where the privacy change is basically only happening on Apple and not on Google. Although one can debate about spillovers later. And this already brings me to the last part of the empiric strategy. Um, maybe for some of you, it might be straightforward or uh, very obvious to compare the same app across the two platforms and see the behavior before and after. And that's why I will distinguish between single and multi-homing apps. Now, um, yeah. With the data, so remember the chronology of events is uh, we have 2021. It's still the year we are currently at. Um, we are somewhat here. <clears throat> and the ATT update uh, was uh, at the end of April, if you remember. And everybody that updated their iOS device to 14.5 um, got this prompt, right? But now one peculiar thing about these iOS updates or updates in general, maybe you can relate. It's not like every user on the planet has this update on the next day, but it somewhat depends on your user preferences and also on the preferences by Apple to push these notifications for update. And gratefully enough, there are companies that somewhat measure this adoption. And as you can see, the vast adoption came around in June. So this is where really the, the impact um, began of the ATT um, privacy change. And now for the period from February until now, basically, I have a monthly panel of 630,000 apps on Apple. Um, I got them around uh, the end of last year by collecting the top apps uh, for several weeks on App Any and collected their similar apps. For Google, I have even more than that because I somewhat base also this on a continued data set that goes back to 2015. And also there are more apps on Google than on Apple in some sense. And so these are the two main data sets for, for Google and Apple. Both are actually crawled the same way um, at the same time. And also um, this continued panel is also based on, on top apps and it's also somewhat every month um, validated by, by other um, sources. And so what I then also do is I match the two. So I just look up every app that I have on Apple on Apptopia. Apptopia is a nice page where you can go on an Apple app and there is a drop down menu if there is a sibling Google Play app. Um, and by this, I, I gathered 150K matched apps. And now for the data, what I want essentially to do is to have uh, comparable information on app developers data collection and monetization strategies. Monetization is really straightforward on both platforms. On both, we have information on the apps page, um, on prices and inner prices. Uh, it becomes a bit harder if you want, we, we want to look into um, relevant measures that being privacy and ads. So this is the other side of the coin to some extent. So we have these payments and um, advertisements and sharing user data on the other hand. But I will try to do my best to, to make these things comparable. For, for the Google Play Store, we have the permissions 
that come somewhat give you an indication what kind of data is um, actually collected. And also on the apps page, there is an item or a field where developers can say whether it contains ads or not. So this is, these are somewhat my measures for privacy and ads on Google. Unfortunately, I don't have this on Apple, but on Apple, we have these privacy labels and I will exploit them to make uh, comparable measures. Now to the privacy layers, because this is also new and Google is also going to, to implement them, maybe some words on that. So what this actually is, is it's like a nutrition label, but it's not how healthy the app is, but rather how healthy the data collection is. And so it's kind of categorized in, the, in three parts. It's the data used to track you. So this is what ATT is about, data linked to users and data not linked to users. For each of these three, the developer has to declare what kind of data, so in somewhat the theme, um, what kind of data is collected. And since somewhat the purpose is already given for the first data type, data used to track you, we all, the, 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 uh, the nutrition label by Apple adds another layer for these two columns and gives somewhat an idea of the purpose of the data collection, all right? Maybe you already have a clue how I somewhat retrieve some information comparable with the Play Store. Some of this data necessitates to access certain permissions. Like you cannot really collect data on location without having the permission to collect location data. And if the purpose of data collection is ads, then probably you place an ad in the app. And of course, this is somewhat a selection only for those that has, have these privacy labels and collect data, I can make the claim, but it's yeah, the best I can do. And so this is also maybe a point to pause and I can show you the nutrition label of Facebook in the meantime, when I ask, uh, wait for someone oh, um, saying something about the presentation or maybe there is a question. So this takes a bit of time, but maybe someone has a question to fill the gap. So it's still going. Yeah. It's not an endless loop. So yeah, this is the information I'm going to leverage. And one striking fact is whenever I look into this kind of data on Apple apps and the privacy labels, so the vast majority of apps in the app store they did not provide any details on privacy labels. So it's not like they do not collect any, no data because there is also a field. I do not collect data in the privacy labels. They just haven't submitted the privacy labels because you're only obliged to do this whenever you update an app or launch a new one. And interestingly enough, apps seem to shy away from doing this, maybe they are also not maintained anymore or uh, there are different reasons, but there was also uh, this whole um, debate about Google postponing updates um, and not uh, updating the privacy labels. Um, and now for these privacy labels, for those that have provided privacy labels, you can see that the majority actually of those, uh, they collect data, most often it's data not linked to users, but there's also a share that uses data to track. And especially this is the, the share are much higher for free and popular apps. So popular in terms of ratings. Now, and this brings me to the slide before. So what I have for this data, payment, privacy and ads. Payment, I can do it for both uh, data sets for all the apps. For privacy and ads, I have to limit myself on Apple to those that have these privacy labels. So it's a selection. So it's um, something you have to care about. Now, um, coming really quick to the first hypothesis and some descriptors first, and then some regressional analysis. Um, so what we have here is some, uh, some evidence on hypothesis one. So apps um, being less likely to use data for tracking after ATT. So what you have is access the time 
vertical line highlights the introduction of the ATT. So this is the last pre-ATT period. And I somewhat um, make the shares before and after relative to the, or uh, the amount relative to the pre-ATT period. So in July, um, 2021, only 90% of uh, the amount of um, the pre-ATT era um, use data to track users. So there is an, a decrease in the share of apps that uh, use data to track users following this ATT. And what is also interesting, other types of data, we don't see this kind of decrease. And, and this is somewhat an um, evidence of this hypothesis that um, maybe tracking users or using data to track is less attractive. One can maybe also make the claim that it's app developers maybe also avoiding showing the prompt because whenever you collect this kind of data, you have to show this prompt. And some types of this data used to track that are shown in the privacy labels are decreasing even more, except for identifiers and location. But in some sense, we cannot compare this with the Play Store. So this is just like some Apple specific um, result, all right? And now let's turn to the other part of the H1 where we look into um, the profitability of ads and whether you are more likely to use ads or not. Um, this is only for Apple, um, this regression, and only for those with privacy labels. And what I'm going to explain in this regression, so the dependent variable is, do I make an advertisement? Uh, do I have an advertisement in the app or not as a developer? And have the other monetization strategies as control variables with the expected signs that somewhat it's, ch uh, it's a choice between advertisement or payment and in-app purchases are somewhat a complement as we saw with Flurry Analytics. And we have fixed effects um, to rule out time constant unobserved heterogeneity to just look within the app how it e evolves. And what you can actually see here with the time dummy variables with the reference category being February 21, there is a strong adoption in advertisements up until the privacy change ATT. So it's very strong increase up until April 21, and then it's a leveling off. And one maybe see a certain decline. Um, for sure, we will see it in the coming months, um, how this evolves. But, um, what we can especially see is that this dynamic is broken on uh, Apple, at least for these uh, few months before. And of course, if I now include a coefficient for, for the post ATT period, which is ATT here, it's positive and significant only if I include a in linear time trend uh, that kind of warrants or considers this development pre-ATT, we have this kind of evidence that ATT somewhat decreases this trend or even slows it down and levels it off. And this is especially true for the subsample for multi-homing apps, because remember I have this problem of only having a selective sample on Apple that have, that have these privacy labels. And I don't want to compare now the selective sample with the whole sample on Google. And what I do is I restrict to those that multi-home. So where I have the very same app on Apple and Google, there I do not, I, I kind of rule out the selection problem of privacy labels because I'm only looking into the same apps on both platforms. And what I then can do, I can run the same regression again, but now on a sample of Apple and Google apps, so do I place an, an ad as an app developer uh, on Apple and on Google and have, again, the monetization methods as the um, control variables and the app fixed effects right here. And here, uh, the time dummy variables somewhat show a common pattern across platforms, while the ATT is somewhat treatment indicator for apps only on Apple after the um, policy change, right? So it's insignificant to some degree, 
uh, not to some degree, it is insignificant. And uh, what we surely see is the development of the time dummy variables. So this is like the common trend. And what you can see here, if you uh, make it a bit more nicely uh, in a coefficient plot with the pre ATT period as the reference category, you can see this huge growth until the ATT and afterwards there is a decline in the likelihood of putting ads in their app. And this is somewhat true for um, these multi-homing apps. Again, this is a very selective sample and um, uh, with a grain of salt to, to, to be interpreted, but um, it's also something that Flurry Analytics, for example, um, suggested in, in their communications that there is somewhat uh, a change in, in the revenue mix. And the change in the revenue mix is a good thing for a hypothesis too, because this is exactly what they claim. And this is also what I show. So the turning towards payment and for this, again, some descriptives for uh, the share of paid apps by the platform um, on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we have our period of observation. Uh, the vertical line uh, is the last pre-ATT period. And as you can see, there are two observations. There are more paid apps on Apple than on Google. Um, and following the ATT policy change, there is a, um, a sudden increase after a somewhat negative trend on both platforms. Albert, I admit it's on a very low level. Of course, I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of apps in this sample, but still it's, it's a modest in, increase in the share of paid apps. But there, there seems to be a divergence following ATT. And for in-app pay, uh, we observe a positive trend that is accelerated on Apple. So, uh, a similar thought here. And what we can now do here is leverage both complete data sets for Apple and Google. So take all the, the apps and look into um, the likelihood or like the probability of an app to be for pay as a function of other monetization strategies like in-app purchases, again, app fixed effects. And this is for now only the, the Apple data set um, so only looking into a before and after on Apple. And here the time dummy variables show this uh, increase that you showed uh, that you saw already in the descriptive part. And so starting in June, there seems to be an increase in the, sh in the likelihood of an app being for pay. And if I do a post ATT uh, dummy, then this is also positive and significant. And now maybe an interesting part is to distinguish between apps that are only uh, present on Apple and with those that are multi-homing. And you can see that this change is somewhat driven by apps that are only present on Apple, at least for now. And I can do the same part for in-app purchases um, here. We also have this kind of uh, evidence of a positive trend of in-app pay and this um, acceleration after the ATT and also the, the, the larger impact to some extent or relationship for a single homing um, apps on Apple. And having this single homing, multi-homing apps, we can now turn towards an analysis having Apple and Google, so making it a different diff instead of a before and after. So what we have here is again, a um, similar setting. So in columns one and two, we have the question, the, the dependent variable being, is the app for pay or not? One, if it is, so at least actually 100. And then explanatory variables, again, the in-app purchasing dummy variable and a time fixed effect and the app fixed effect. And as you can see, uh, the, the treatment or the ATT, uh, policy change dummy variable being equal only one for apps on Apple after the policy change is positive and significant. So the, this kind of uptick in uh, the share of paid apps is somewhat peculiar to, to the uh, Apple platform. And it's mostly driven by those that single home. 
and the same is true for the in-app purchasing. So it seems to be that um, this is something very specific to Apple that um, following the ATT, more apps are turning towards uh, payment options. If we believe that there is something happening um, as well next to the ATT, right? That's the going assumption. All right. And this uh, brings me to the conclusion. Uh, I have to really um, admit that these are preliminary results, uh, some of which uh, uh, are like a month ago. And so, and these are also very short run effects, right? And what I find is that the likelihood of tracking and ads decrease with ATT. And also they turn, the apps turn towards uh, payment options more often after this privacy change by, by Apple. Um, I have to stress it again, this is very short run. There are news reports that app developers are still waiting and are certain about the impact. Um, also because if you remember the adoption chart, the true um, impact of ATT was only visible in, in late June. So I'm still waiting for some months to go to, to see whether it changes even further. But what I didn't really talk about, but um, what is maybe worth talking about, and we had the question already, is who is the winner of the of this change, right? And how does it also change the, maybe the market structure, but also who is kind of gaining in the, in the, in the long run? And there are maybe two thoughts of, um, yeah, discussion that we can now uh, move on to is on the one hand um, this change may favor those that have a huge ecosystem that can track people or users within the ecosystem and also it may favor large firms that can easily change between revenue models right i mean in-app purchases aren't an easy thing to to implement and um maybe it's also a bit easier if, if you already have a certain reputation to spend some money on it and uh, the final thing, and uh, Daniel already alluded to it, I mean, there is also an antitrust perspective with, with Apple as the rule maker and also what are the motives and incentives to do it and how to, to implement it. On the one hand, we have this uh, receiving a, a revenue cut of all the payment options, but also the other one to have a somewhat different standards to, to personalized ads by Apple and also the, the ad business on its own by, by Apple that kind of also competes uh, with, with the one that is affected now with the change. And there are complaints in Germany and France by publishers um, and competition authorities look into that and really forward looking to, the, to these investigations and maybe some of the stuff I presented helps them with it. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. So, oh, I, can, I think we have some questions already. So uh, please maybe go ahead, uh, Mikhail Patikas. Hi, Reynold. Hi, Mikhail. Okay, fantastic and really relevant uh, work and etc. I have two comments. The one is, it's a little bit, I have a little bit concern about the diff diff in the sense that not all uh, iOS apps are affected the, the same way because this, as you already said, and etc. this is uh, depends on the user base of its application. How often they do update the application, first, the, 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 iOS, the operating system, first of all, and second, if they do uh, opt out or not from the um, uh, from do not tracking option and etc. So each app depends from its base of users. And at the moment, you do the, the, the assumption that all apps have more or less homogeneous user base. Okay, because if you have all the homogeneous user base, you can somehow do the, the kind of different. Diff. This is a kind of small concern. I think with some kind of sensitivity analysis, you can deal with that. Okay, and my other thing is which I think it's mostly. And, and important for me and directly to the big picture was your last comments and et cetera. One fact that the Google apps, the, the, the multi-homers, 
okay, or the changes driven by, by, by single homers, let's put it like this, is the fact that the cost of changing application, it's lower, and also the cost from the change of the policy, it's higher for them. So for the ones that are multi-homing, again, it depends a lot from which the user base is coming from. It's coming from, from, from Google mostly, it's coming from iOS, it's 50-50, again, it's over there because if my user base is coming 80% is coming from, from Google, so there is no reason to change anything on the app and et cetera, or my whole business model and et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of, of, of um, uh, this might, as you, as you said, might affect the ones that who get the, have the already data and et cetera, but also might affect also depending on if you're so much dependent from the iOS or not. So this is kind of, of, of way. And a final comment, do you know if there's any kind of, of alternative to this identification number to the IDFA? Is there any kind of alternative solutions to that that big firms might have adopted in order to circumvent this, this, uh, this issue? Thank you very much. As ever, uh, really great points. Um, starting with the last one first. So um, actually there have been some initiatives uh, at the very beginning of this year, also by a Chinese consortium to have this uh, Chinese advertising identifier and Apple cracks down on these um, fingerprinting technologies to circumvent the, the, the identifier for, for advertisers. Of course, if it's within the, the, the ecosystem, then you're good to go. But I think the, the circumvention and, and kind of ruling out this uh, identifier for, for advertiser is, I don't know how, how enforced it is by Apple, but there were news reports about this, uh, this one initiative that uh, uh, was torn down by, by Apple in the, in the end. Um, now for, for the, uh, kind of affect heterogeneity because maybe there are some apps where the, the user base isn't opting out. I think this is a very good point and there are also some there are also some statistics which categories and um, which type of apps do, do, do experience more opt-outs than others. So we certainly leverage that because I didn't really look into those uh, because maybe one can also look into those that change the revenue mix and kind of deduct from there whether these are very much affected by the so like a valid, val, uh, validity check by this and um, yeah for 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 the dependence on the ios users and user base um, uh, i can certainly look into the the ratings as a measure i mean for ios unfortunately i don't have that many um, user base numbers but maybe i can can work with that and actually have the comparison. So maybe the, the ratings on, on Apple and Google and compare this as, as somewhat proxies for user base and the importance of one of the other. Yes, I, I think this would be a fantastic idea. So, so since you have the number of reviews, ratings, and et cetera, the number of evaluations, and you can use this as number of, of sales or performance and et cetera, mm -hmm. you, can, you, you can definitely do that and see how if the ones that depend more on, on iOS, there are the ones that um, mostly react to that. So have the, the case of single homing for the ones that really, really 100% depend on the on, on iOS. But later on, you have some kind mm -hmm. of huge heterogeneity of so starting from 99% to zero because everyone is also because with the single mm -hmm. homers from, from, from um, Google app, uh, apps. Cool. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. Good work. Any other questions? Oh yeah, Daniel. Yeah, so thank you very much for the talk. I think uh, my comment is related to Mikael's, but I think it has a different uh, implication. So you showed the results in terms of share of apps, right? Or number of apps. And I wondered, and you, you also showed the uptick and discussed, okay, maybe maybe it's it's something, maybe it's very small. And there, I wondered whether you, you could um, say something more about this user base of specific apps and try to, to estimate the volume that is actually behind there. So also with regard to the introduction of an 
in a purchase whether i don't know whether prices are available so to but at least uh, the customer base there should be proxies and then the picture could be a little bit more enlightening whether these are actually important apps or not right because we have so many apps and some of them or a lot of them are probably have a very small user base and so we probably don't care too much about them but then there are very few apps that that are very important and of course if those change the business model this is much more important and could also shed light on whether 0.2 percent is important or not just not uh, the number and then maybe one more thing to think about i'm, I'm not clear about that myself but i wondered what are the implications in the advertising ecosystem so also whether there are spillover effects between the the decision in the um, apple ecosystem to the android ecosystem so whether actually it's good for google and android that this that advertising becomes harder on ios so are advertisers valuing the ios platform more or is it rather bad for them because this tracking and matching becomes harder so i'm not sure about that but this could be interesting thanks yeah thank you very much uh, again great points yeah so i i do have the the, the prices of of like the inner purchase or the price of the app so i can definitely do that and also look into the the, the ratings um as the as the user base because i have this for for both i mean one drawback is that you can reset ratings on apple so it's voluntarily but you you can actually do this as an app developer so maybe this might be a bit of a drawback but what i also have is uh, are the rankings of apps in the in the top 100 for both um, google and apple so i can also see whether the composition somewhat changes or some some apps get more uh, important uh, with this change and the implications of the ad ecosystem i mean th this is a really great point and i'm i'm not sure about it either and also to some extent what kind of spillovers this whole change also has i mean if i think about reprogramming an app um that maybe also shares some code base like so i'm not really involved in programming apps so i don't know whether this is true but maybe it's worthwhile to 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 do it for all for both of these apps rather than for one app and so the change might have some spillovers to some degree so also a bit curious about that but implications for the ad ecosystem i mean i have this somewhat anecdotal evidence that advertiser spending is is now higher on on android and and what i also found is interesting is the question whether some android apps are compensating the losses of ios apps uh, to some degree because now with the influx of of more uh, money in the the android space so and this is an, uh, an advantage of multi-homing apps to some degree that they can sit out this change for a certain period of time so yeah but great point So do we have other questions? If not, then if I may. Um, so so I've also been wondering about the, this single versus multi-homing thing and potential spillover effects. You showed that uh, the change you observed was mainly for the single homing ones, uh, which I, well, my, personal interpretation when I looked at it was also that perhaps there are some spillover effects for the multi-homing ones so that the apps are adjusted for both systems at once one for programming reasons but also perhaps uh, not everyone can you know like handle two separate business models at the same time probably uh, so perhaps it's not really that only that this only affects single homing ones but that the change isn't that large for my home because it, it occurred in both places. But I'm also wondering if uh, over the period uh, that you observe, is there any change in the apps like that there's single homing apps and then they be start multi-homing or the other way around? Because uh, you included app fixed effects. Uh, 
Um, and you included the interaction of the single homing, but you didn't include the single homing as a separate term. So I've been wondering if this is something that also can change or not. And if it does change over the period, perhaps you could also check if after the ATT, whether there's a change in how many apps start multi-homing to iOS um, or the other way around. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if you understand what I mean. Uh, basically, there's generally some apps uh, each month there's start, you know, multi-homing to iOS. So it is decreased after ATT, but perhaps it doesn't decrease the other way around. So from iOS to Google. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so to your first point with the spillovers and also that it happens like simultaneously, maybe also on both platforms that the time fixed effects in the last uh, regression also show that there is this pattern of uh, reduced negative uh, trend that you also see in the in this, this descriptive part that there is like also a small uptick on Google as well. So, um, and this is also what you see in the in the, uh, in the time fixed effects. Um, so this is definitely something I have to be careful about. And for the single multi-homing, I mean, it's, um, I defined it. So I didn't, so I just looked at one period in time where the, they, there is a match on Google or not. So I didn't uh, do the whole exercise with the Apple panel now, uh, some periods later, maybe I have to revisit this and see whether, um, what I also can do is uh, I can do this based on the textual similarity of the app names, but I thought I'd, I'd, there is an easier way to do this. Um, if you are comparing, I don't know, 600K with 1 million, it's always easier to, so at least for me to scrape Aptopia and see who already did that uh, as opposed to me doing it. And only afterwards I checked for the similarity of the, of the matches by the text. But yes, um, that's definitely something. I mean, it, it could also very much be that someone is op opting out of uh, having an app on a certain platform. That's what I meant with the exit. Um, uh, with hypothesis too, that you're just giving up maybe on iOS and stay for Android. But I mean, the the the, the costs of uh, running an app if you already have one uh, also have to be considered to some degree, right? But thanks, very good points. So perhaps just to add that. Uh, well, uh, I guess if you already have those apps that are multi-homing and you can already identify them, then perhaps you could get the release dates from both places. And that way, perhaps you would see some variation in when they were single or, but I'm not sure if there's, you know, any advantage to doing that. I mean, it's, 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 for sure an information whether the app was first released on Apple rather than on Google or the other way around. And I can see that. So I have the release dates of both um, uh, apps or well, both platforms because they are somewhat hidden in the metadata of each app's uh, store page. So one could actually also look into entry in, in both platforms with a there is also somewhat reduced entry in, in, in Apple because it's now um, more difficult to get uh, revenues. And so maybe also change in that direction. Thank you very much. So do we have any other questions? One last one I have is, do you know perhaps if there was a change in new arrivals to both uh, platforms or have, I don't know if you've tracked this as well. 
So yes, I track new arrivals um, because I still scrape the top rankings and whenever a good app comes along and goes into these top rankings, um, I can see uh, those apps on a monthly basis and also um, whether some apps appear in the similar apps of others. This is the other way how I retrieve new apps. So I can look into that. Certainly what I wanted to look into anyways is whether the composition of the top rankings changed on Apple as opposed to um, uh, Google, because to some degree, I was also wondering how users uh, reacted to the, because I'm mostly focusing on the supply side right now. And I don't know about the um, demand side, whether there was a certain reaction also to, to possible changes that we observe here, but also to the prompts some apps are showing or, um, yes. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you everyone. Um, I guess we do not have any other questions. So thank you all for participating and thank you Reinhold for the great presentation. And yeah, hopefully see you uh, at the next meetings. Thank you very much for all the comments and the discussion. Thanks. Thanks also for having me, of course. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.